Welcome back. This week's lectures are on uh, high-rise design and specifically lateral forces. So forces that um, affect building frames, particularly high-rises. We'll get into high-rise design specifically in the second part of these lectures. In the first part, I want to talk about these lateral forces, particularly wind and seismic, that affect all building structures but are particularly uh, important when we are designing tall buildings. By tall, we mean usually with a proportion that's more than two to one high. So as we'll see, uh, wind and seismic are forces that act sideways, right, in the lateral direction. And because we're so used to designing for gravity, we have to sort of think outside the box a little bit and think about what happens not only to, uh, what we have to do not only to keep buildings uh, standing up, uh, but also basically to keep them from falling over. Um, buildings rarely fall right over, uh, although uh, it, it happens very uh, rarely, but occasionally. Um, usually what happens in a lateral failure is much more subtle, uh, but not unimportant. So we have a handful of ways uh, that, we, that we experience lateral failures. Um, some of them are pretty obvious. Uh, on the upper left, uh, racking here where we have a series of uh, what we call pin connections. I'll talk about what these are in a little bit. And because they're not triangular like a truss, uh, a force from the side is able to turn those nice rectangular bays uh, into parallelograms. Um, we have a version of this called a soft story where we might reinforce our bays on an upper floor, but either because we have uh, something like a parking garage or something on the lower floors, um, we're not as diligent about it. And you can see that this is a racking failure just as much as this one is. Um, it's just that there's only one story uh, that's now rotating, but of course that's risking taking the, the whole building with it. We get other potential failures that are a little bit more familiar from column design. So buildings can experience excess bending, as you see in the upper right. They can experience uh, shear in the lower left, and they can also uh, experience uh, torsion. Uh, or twisting, and, and this is something that we don't usually consider when we're talking about basic element design, but starts to be a problem when we get either asymmetrical structural layouts uh, or asymmetrical lateral loads, a wind that, that blows more on one part of the building uh, than another. Um, we also get a problem called drift, uh, where um, buildings are, are just simply flexible enough that they're moving side to side in ways that uh, may make occupants literally motion sick, uh, or at least give the impression that the building is, is not uh, adequate to the job. And then finally, a, a failure that we'll call a design failure uh, is when we uh, maybe consider lateral stability too late or doing some retrofit. And what we find is that the, the tools that it takes to actually stabilize these structures get in the way uh, of program or, or function. Again, in most of these, we're not really concerned so much with a really catastrophic failure. Um, it's, it's, again, very, very rare that we see buildings actually coming down for any of these reasons. What we're usually worried about, though, in lateral uh, problems is serviceability. So either, in the case of drift, we find that occupants get seasick uh, or uh, that they, they just report excessive motion, very discomforting thing, especially in a skyscraper. But you can also imagine that if a building is racking, uh, we might experience kind of functional failures, like door frames may go from rectangular to parallelogram. Doors might not open. Or in the case of bending, we might find that if we drop a pen on our office floor, it suddenly rolls to the exterior wall. Um, these are all uh, serious problems. They may not be catastrophic or fatal problems, but we consider them failures nonetheless. And we design our lateral strategies not only so that buildings uh, are strong enough, stiff enough, uh, but mostly so that they are serviceable, that they don't get uh, either out of shape uh, or out of line. The first uh, lateral uh, issue that we'll talk about is wind. Uh, we'll cover that uh, and some strategies for dealing with that in this lecture, and then we'll move on to seismic in the next uh, little bite uh, of a lecture. Uh, wind forces are probably the most immediately apparent lateral force. They happen uh, again, parallel to the ground, so perpendicular to the, the uh, direction that we're usually thinking of our, ourselves as being concerned with, right? Pushing, building over, pushing buildings over uh, instead of making them fall down. Uh, 
And we deal with wind more or less depending on uh, what the local climate conditions are like. Uh, in North America, we're particularly concerned with hurricanes. And you can see that the Gulf Coast, uh, the, the southern east coast uh, of the United States, we uh, design buildings for really extraordinary winds uh, in Miami up to 120 miles an hour. Um, you'll see in the Midwest, we don't uh, design for those so much. You may be thinking, well, tornadoes certainly exceed 120 miles an hour. And tornadoes are such kind of uh, spatially specific and rare conditions that we, we don't force ourselves to design specifically for them. Instead, what we do with tornadoes, our, our kind of approach to uh, lateral stability in a tornado is to keep the occupants safe, sacrifice the building, but to give people some place to go like a, like a basement or something like that. Um, hurricanes, on the other hand, uh, hit Florida, uh, you know, on average w once a year or once every other year. And so we would like our buildings to survive those. In those conditions, we actually do design for hurricane force winds over uh, 120 miles an hour. And you can see that this is moderated somewhat by uh, exposure. So if we are inland a little bit, then uh, we're allowed to kind of decrease uh, those wind speeds. If we're severely exposed, then we actually have to design for the maximum anticipated wind basically in any given year. This uh, wind also affects buildings uh, differently depending on how tall they are, how far above the ground they are. Um, if we are in a, a large city or if we're in an area with a lot of hills, even with a lot of trees, we find that there's a pretty substantial gradient in the wind speed uh, from the actual uh, ground all the way up uh, to 1,500, 1,600 feet uh, and, and above. The jet stream, which occurs you know, between 20 and 30,000 feet, uh, can get up to 300, 350 miles an hour. So you can imagine these exponential curves just sort of going and going and going. And what you see, of course, is that the further away you get from the ground, no matter what the conditions are actually at the ground, um, the higher the wind speeds tend to be. The less impeded they are, the less friction they have with the ground, uh, and therefore the, the more powerful they are. This is a problem with ultra-high buildings because if you think about uh, a skyscraper structure is basically being not only a gravity structure, but also a cantilever that's sticking up out of the ground to resist wind forces. We're not only, as we get taller and taller, extending the length of the cantilever, we're also increasing the load that we're putting on the top of the cantilever, the most vulnerable uh, position. So wind speed gradients are super critical in how we think about uh, designing the building, for, especially for bending and shear, uh, when we're looking at putting a, a huge load at the very, very tip of a, of a fairly vulnerable cantilever structure. The other thing that we have to keep in mind is that we're, when we put uh, especially tall buildings out there, we're basically putting uh, a shape that is more or less aerodynamic into the wind stream. And so even though we typically think of wind as pushing a building, trying to like push a building over, um, wind can have very complex effects, even on a fairly simple shape. So here you can see the wind uh, hitting the building coming from the, the lower left. And we would expect, of course, to have very positive pressure there, right? The wind pushing against uh, a building facade or surface. But if we look at a section and think about how that airflow is going to move around, say, a rectangular building, what we find is that on the leeward side, the side away from the wind, uh, we can actually get very significant negative pressures. In other words, the eddies that the wind forms, the turbulence that the building creates in the wind, can actually create negative pressure that's now trying to suck the facade off of the building instead of trying to push the building over. You can see, too, that depending on the shape, we may have negative pressure also on roofs. So we have to think very carefully, especially if we're using like a membrane roofing. We need to find a way to either attach that uh, or to weigh it down. And you can see, too, that depending on how uh, any openings in the building work, we may experience significant negative pressure in indoor areas as well. So important to think not only about the wind as a kind of static pressure on the building, but also to think about our buildings as aerodynamic objects and what they do to the wind pressure on the windward side, uh, the leeward side, but also, as you can see, on literally every exposed plane uh, of the building. And, and that pressure can be positive uh, or negative. Also important to point out 
that the wind is going to change directions, even though there may be prevailing winds. We may have wind from a, a, a single direction for, for much of the year. Um, we always have to design for any possibility. And of course, depending on weather patterns, uh, wind can come from absolutely anywhere. So what we end up doing, especially when we're designing curtain walls, is we're thinking about not only the positive pressure that the wind can put on them, how, how we have to design for the, the, the curtain wall to be pushed against the building. We also have to design for negative pressure. What happens when the wind shifts around? And those turbulent eddies are now trying to pull the, the curtain wall actually off of the building structure. The mechanics of uh, lateral loading, as I said before, when we get tall, uh, start to uh, function like a giant uh, cantilever. And so what we find is that, as you see down here on the lower left, um, we have uh, wind forces that are at a gradient, right? Small at the base, larger at the top. Um, those are going to have a centroid, and we can basically calculate the exposed area of the building. We can use a little bit of math to calculate the greatest expected wind speed uh, times the area of the building and get like a single force uh, that will be working on it. You can see here that um, we're putting that force uh, at two thirds of the way up because the gradient is a triangle, not a rectangle. And you can see that that gives us, uh, the taller the building is, obviously the longer the lever arm. And therefore, if you remember from beam theory, the greater the overturning moment. So the, the wind here is trying to turn the building uh, over, right? It's trying to, to turn the building, uh, in this case, clockwise. What we have working for us, on the other hand, is usually a fairly heavy building. So that building mass operates through the centroid of the building structure, and that is going to give us a resisting moment. It's going to have a very, very short lever arm, maybe compared with the overturning lever arm. But what we have going for us is that building structures are very, very heavy. So in this case, uh, here in the lower left, the wind is trying to basically rotate the building around the base uh, in a clockwise direction. We have a resisting moment in the counterclockwise direction that is equal to the building mass, the weight of the building, times basically the, the distance from its centroid to the edge of the, of the foundation or the, the edge of the structure. Now, there are a couple of ways that we can help our cause here. We can design very low, very flat buildings, uh, as you see here, where the wind forces are going to be relatively small and the resisting lever arm is gonna be relatively great. But we can also change the mass of the building or, or the shape of the building so that its footprint is wider, that we give ourselves a, a greater uh, uh, resisting moment arm, not necessarily by increasing the mass of the building, although we can certainly do that, but if we're trying to save material, we might deploy it in a way that, that basically spreads it out over a wider footprint at the base and gives the wind a, a smaller sail basically to operate at the top. So here you can see we're using essentially cantilever theory to reduce the amount of exposed area toward the top, to increase the, the, uh, the resisting lever arm at the base, and therefore basically to fight what we call the overturning moment uh, more effectively. And we can think of all types, all kinds of tall buildings that do this from the Eiffel Tower uh, to electricity pylons to the John Hancock Tower in Chicago, right? All of those uh, taper from the base to the top. And that has this twofold effect, right? Increasing the footprint at the base, increasing the uh, resisting moment arm, and also giving the wind less area to push at uh, at the top where a cantilever uh, is going to be most, uh, most vulnerable. When we get into the design of the building shape, again, we're looking at an aerodynamic object. And even though we may want to design rectangular shapes because those are most functional, um, what we sometimes find, especially when we get into super tall structures, is that those create eddies that uh, may create ne very negative pressure and may in extreme cases actually create uh, sort of harmonic motion, right? Those eddies uh, may uh, form and may disperse in ways that actually vibrate the building back and forth, right? Make it swing like a, like a pendulum. Um, obviously we can shape the building to either prevent those eddies. You can see an elliptical shape here that creates much less turbulence. 
Um, we can also do things that actually make things worse. So here you can see a, a triangular form that really forms much more turbulence behind it uh, than a rectangular form. And these vortices, again, are potentially problematic not only for the negative pressure they create, uh, but also for the potential harmonic motion they can create. We also want to be conscious of doing things like funneling wind through openings in our building. So here you can see that all of the wind pressure that's trying to uh, basically push the building over is getting funneled through this very, very narrow opening. That's going to create a very high velocity airflow as, as, that, um, as, as the air on one side tries to basically catch up with the free flowing air uh, on, on the other. In section, notice that we can design buildings to uh, work either better or worse with the wind as well. So here you see a couple of areas where the, the flowing air is actually getting trapped under either a canopy or an overhang or behind a parapet. All of these now have to be designed for potential uplift, right? Or, or the wind actually trying to, to pick that piece of the building up or, or putting upward pressure on it in ways that we might not have anticipated if we've just designed for gravity loads. Here too, when we have long spanning uh, roofs, you can see that even on what's technically the windward side of the building, uh, that gentle slope of the roof is causing air to move much more quickly over the top, and that can create negative pressure as, uh, as well. So occasionally, like we're thinking about ways that the wind is working on buildings that at first might seem really counterintuitive, pulling things even on the windward side of the building or actually pushing up, uh, making us design uh, for uh, forces that are actually opposite to or counter to uh, gravity. Fortunately, we've got a lot of tools we can use to test this. And these days, if you're designing any kind of very long span structure or any high rise structure, you'll do one of two things. You'll either subject it to wind tunnel testing, where you'll literally put a model of the building into a, a wind tunnel, just like we would for uh, aircraft design. And you'll use uh, little uh, smoke streams or streamers to see exactly how the wind is going to perform from various directions. Um, here you can see that both of these models are on turntables. So they can rotate those to any direction and find out exactly uh, how the wind is, is gonna perform. Uh, these days, they can also put uh, little servos underneath them, detect how much the building is actually moving uh, under the, the force of wind. And this helps engineers, architects to fine tune the shape uh, of towers, particularly uh, to reduce that, that overturning moment. I'm also very common in computational flow dynamics where we're digitally simulating these. Um, this allows us to look at many more uh, different conditions. And it also allows a little bit more of a fine-grained analysis of what's happening, for instance, on a specific curtain wall panel uh, instead of on the building uh, as a whole. Now, armed with that knowledge, we can come up with strategies to try to resist the anticipated wind forces. And almost all of what we'll be doing uh, in, in these is basically trying to stabilize every point in a building frame uh, with some combination of uh, what we call lateral structures. And these are in the simplest form going to be just like diagonals in a rectangular frame. So if you think about it, if we've got a, a one dimensional structure, uh, right, a flagpole and we have a point on top of it that we wanna stabilize, well, we've already stabilized that in the Z direction against gravity with the flagpole itself. And you can see that it's going to take us two more pieces, one in the X axis, one in the Y axis, to take care of forces from any direction. So we are taking care of gravity loads, we're taking care of wind in the left-right direction in the x-axis, and we're taking care of wind in, let's call it the up-down direction in the y-axis, right? This is gonna give us a tripod, uh, a, a basically something that is triangular in any, uh, any direction. As we're stabilizing a plane, uh, you can see that to stabilize two points, in the X direction now, if we've laid out our structure uh, along those lines, um, we only need one uh, brace. So here you can see that that brace is gonna have an X component that can resist uh, the force that we're putting on it. And notice that because we have basically a girder here connecting the points, 
that brace can actually stabilize both of those points. Uh, because if we've stabilized this point, we have rigidly connected this point to it uh, with a, a member that can take compression or tension, then all we need to do is stabilize either one of those and we've stabilized the entire structure. Um, in two directions, you can see that we've got a little bit of a problem because now we have to stabilize both of those, right? A, a force here, uh, if that diagonal wasn't there, um, that point could still rotate around the first point that we stabilized. And so in the y-axis now, uh, we need two braces uh, instead of just one. And here you can see we call this basically a, a, a buttress. Finally, we design volumes typically. So the real way that this works is that we need to look for ways to stabilize all four points uh, in a cubic structure. So here, wind in the x-axis, you see we have braces for both of those points in the x-axis and both of those points in the y-axis, and we call this a braced cube. Again, we're using the building structure, we're using these girders now as uh, compression or tension members to basically distribute that lateral resistance from point to point. When we get into this, we start to get more and more uh, concerned with how those joints actually operate. And we have a, a kind of family of potential structural joints or connections that we can start to use to, to think about distributing this lateral resistance through a, a structure. Usually what we've talked about so far is what's called a pin connection. In other words, we're, we're uh, connecting two members in a way that uh, they cannot translate relative to one another, right? If one moves left to right, then the other one moves left to right. Um, but we're connecting them in a way that they can rotate relative to one another. This was important when we were doing beam design because we needed to establish points of zero moment, right? When we were finding reactions, we needed pin connections to make beams solvable algebraically. This is not, however, the only type of connection that we can have. We can also have what's called a fixed or a moment connection where we not only uh, connect the two in a way that prevents them from translating relative to one another, but also in a way that prevents them from rotating. And here you can see in the simplest possible way, we just have a, a little uh, triangular fillet that we put between the two. We guarantee that this angle is always going to be at 90 degrees. Uh, if that changes from 90 degrees, it means that we actually have to break uh, that fillet. And this then means that we have a, a, a connection that can not only transfer um, vertical forces, horizontal forces, but also can transfer moments so that when we try to twist or bend the girder in this case, we now have to also bend or twist uh, the column because that angle is fixed. And just for completion's sake, the third type of connection that we can have is one that actually allows rotation and some translation. Um, these are pretty rare, pretty specialized architecturally. Where we see these a lot are in uh, highway construction, bridge construction, where we have super, super long spans that are going to contract or expand in, uh, in thermal conditions. And we need to allow uh, a bridge deck maybe to move relative to its support. Uh, again, very, fairly rare in architecture. Here though, you can start to understand the advantage of thinking about a connection that uh, not only prevents uh, movement side to side, but also prevents rotation, right? Uh, manages to stiffen the connection uh, without needing a lot of cross bracing uh, or, or anything else. So here on the top, you see some standard uh, pin connections. Uh, in some cases, you can actually visualize the pin itself. And theoretically, uh, we imagine that if we just had, say, a, a, a pin connection with a column and a cantilevered beam, uh, that wouldn't work, right? The beam would be free to rotate relative to the column and it would just fall down. Likewise, a column with a pin connection at the base, we could just push over very easily. And here, crucially, uh, a frame connection that is all pinned uh, might sometimes be a rectangle, right? The shape that we want, um, but would be free under lateral loading to turn into a parallelogram, right? Something that we typically don't want uh, in building structures. You can see the advantage of a fixed connection, right? If we put those little uh, triangular braces in, 
Um, what we end up with is the weight here of the cantilever. You can see it's not only bending the beam portion, but because that angle is fixed, it is also bending the column portion. In a frame, you can see that when we push on a what we call a, a, a fixed or moment frame, all four of those angles are tending to be 90 degrees. And when we push on that column, we're not only bending that column, we're also, structural engineers say, we're recruiting this column on the other side to bend as well. And you can see that the beam is going into this very complex bending shape also. So all three elements of that frame are now working to resist the lateral load. The, the lateral resistance is spread throughout not just one member, but actually three. And here you can see some fairly typical uh, fixed connections, right? In the simplest form here is that triangular uh, uh, brace, triangular brace there. And you can kind of just see here that, that there's uh, a, what we call a torque box uh, at the top of this frame here. All of those are designed to maintain that angle between uh, the beam and the, and the column. So now we have another set of tools. We can uh, certainly brace that planar frame, as you see on the top, with what we call cross bracing. Uh, cables that go into tension or uh, struts that can take compression or tension. Uh, if we use cables, uh, if you think about it, we need to have cables going in both directions since the wind can go either way uh, and, and a, a, a cable obviously can't take any compressive load. Um, if we want to make it into a strut, then we only need one of those. And something that can take tension or compression could, with just one strut, handle lateral loads from either side. We could make these very stiff connections either by uh, using triangular braces or in some cases by uh, making the, the, the connection itself very rigid, oversizing the column, oversizing the girder, using what we call a torque box to make sure that uh, they rotate together. And now you see when we push on this, because all four of these angles uh, are being forced to stay at 90 degrees, we end up putting the columns and I would argue also the girder into bending. We're distributing that bending load throughout the frame. We can also uh, use what's called a shear wall. If we don't need the open space in the frame, we can certainly build these out of concrete or sometimes plywood. And here you can see that we basically have triangulated the frame by just infilling the, the void in the center. And here, to make a shear wall fail, typically we have to have what's called diagonal shear. We have to have a force so great that it literally separates that shear wall uh, along the diagonal. As you can imagine, that takes uh, a tremendous force, right? Shear walls are, are easily the most effective ways uh, of creating this, this lateral bracing. So if, we're, if we have a frame here that we are trying to stabilize, right? this is basically our library of connections. We can use cross bracing. We can use what's called chevron bracing. You can see here we're basically, in the case of cross bracing, you can imagine us making just a great big triangular uh, fillet out of those cross braces. Here with chevron bracing, we're making slightly smaller ones. We can kind of collapse all of that stiffness into actual uh, fillet plates uh, or braces, uh, fixing the connections very stiffly. Here you can see we're doing it with triangular plates. Uh, here just with triangular struts. Uh, we can of course turn those into moment connections if we oversize them. And then finally we can make a, a, a shear wall that basically fills the entire plane. The other trick that we have that makes our lives a little bit easier when we're thinking about lateral stability is that this is transferable. So if we want to stabilize this plane, uh, we can use any of those methods, but we also are typically going to have a floor or a roof that's very stiff that's going on top of that, right? That has what we call diaphragm action. Um, if we have a floor that is stiff enough, it basically works like a shear wall, but now instead of the X and Y axis, it's working in the Z axis. And that diaphragm can transfer some of the stiffness that we're gaining from these elements into other structural planes in the building. So we may find that if we can make one plane stiff enough and we're not getting too far away, I'll talk about uh, problems with this in a second, um, but if we're not getting too far away, what we find is that the floor diaphragm or the roof diaphragm, if we design it to be stiff enough, 
can actually brace frames adjacent to that line of, of stabilization uh, without the need for additional members, right? without the need for additional uh, shear walls or cross braces. And we can use this principle basically in, in building frames to transfer that stiffness uh, in all three directions. So if, for example, we find that um, we can cross brace easily on the upper floors but not on the lower floors, we, can we find that with one or two braces on this ground floor here and with a stiff enough uh, set of connections, we can actually find ways to create lateral stability uh, in, all, uh, in all directions, right? Both the X and, and the Y direction. We can do that with uh, diaphragms, floor diaphragms. We can also do it with horizontal braces. And here you can imagine that a load on each of these three structural lines, um, if we can't say put uh, bracing in this middle plane, we can put bracing on the exterior planes and we can use either horizontal uh, braces or floor diaphragms to transfer that stiffness basically to that middle line. And as you can see, this can get complex. It works in both directions. The, the floor or roof diaphragm is often uh, basically our, our, our best friend when we're trying to think about how to distribute uh, lateral stiffness in a, in a structure. As far as strategies for this, we basically have three places that we can concentrate uh, the, this, this lateral stiffness. We can either approach it on a bay by bay basis. So here you see we have a, a, a couple of bays that we're thinking of basically as sacrificial bays. And we're putting the cross bracing all in those so that even though these are all now jammed up, we might have trouble putting doors or, or windows into those. We've kept a couple of other bays free of that cross bracing. And that might allow the, the function of the building that we need if we're careful about what functions we put where. We have some bays that are closed, uh, some bays that are open. Here you can see that process uh, taking place with, a, with bracing, with a frame, and, and with shear walls. We can also uh, concentrate all of that stiffness on the exterior. We can make stiff exterior walls either with cross bracing, and you can probably think of a couple examples here uh, of buildings that do this. We can also make the exterior frame very stiff, oversized connections, super rigid joints. The interior now can be all pin connections or all much looser connections, and that's contained within a, an encasement or a cage uh, of moment connections that stiffen the building. We can, if we're designing, say, a, a warehouse or something where we maybe don't need so many windows, uh, we can use shear walls on the exterior to take care of this, and this leaves the interior completely free of cross bracing. And then finally, maybe most commonly, we can think about the, the functions, especially in a high rise, um, that naturally need walls or something around them anyway. So elevators, uh, fire stairs, uh, plumbing chases, mechanical chases. If we concentrate those in one area, in the middle of the building, we can also concentrate all of our lateral resistance, whether that's with cross bracing or stiff connections or most commonly uh, shear walls. And we can use that core, that central core, to stiffen the entire building, right? If, if we concentrate all of that here and we use stiff floor diaphragms, what we find is that all of our connections now around the outside of the building structure uh, can be much lighter, right? Don't need cross bracing, uh, don't need shear walls. This makes sense in part because in high-rise construction or even in mid-rise construction, um, those vertical uh, transportation elements those vertical uh, servicing elements all need to be fire protected anyway. When we're connecting multiple floors, remember, we're worried about fire getting from one floor to the next. So for example, an elevator shaft usually has to have a two or three hour firewall around it no matter what. Easy way to do that is to make that firewall out of reinforced concrete. And if we've done that already, we may find that we are already in the ballpark for a shear wall that will help to stabilize the building. So in high-rise construction especially, we look to concentrate the vertical services in, in a core, and then we'll usually try to use that core as our primary means, not only of uh, gravity uh, resistance, but also of lateral resistance, right? Baking those uh, firewalls basically into shear walls.
So in practice, uh, here, here's what some of that looks like. If we're using uh, cross bracing or uh, chevron bracing, what we call a braced frame, uh, here are examples that are uh, tension elements. So very thin rods, or these could be cables. If you look closely, you can see that they have pin connections where they meet the building frame. And these are providing uh, lateral resistance basically across the screen, right? Cross bracing that is handling wind either going left to right or right to left. And you can see that these are relatively thin, but they cross in front of windows. And that's something that occasionally we want to get away from, right? We want windows uh, with an unobstructed view. Um, <clears throat> they're often small enough that we can live with them. Uh, our clients maybe can live with them, obstructions, but relatively small ones. Uh, engineers will generally like this approach because the behavior is very simple. Everything uh, in the lateral direction is handled with an axial load, easy to calculate, uh, reliable ways to, to deal with that. Um, we uh, tend to get less uh, drift, a uh, much more rigid frame, and this is a relatively inexpensive way to provide lateral braces. It's also uh, lightweight, so we're not adding a lot of uh, concrete to the building, not adding a lot of weight uh, to the foundation, and we're not asking the columns or the girders to do the work of stiffening the building. We have a dedicated system now for this. Um, often do this in steel and wood. Uh, concrete, this is a pretty fussy way to do it. Uh, and we tend to see this in tall, skinny buildings. Um, here, a really early uh, example of a, a, a braced frame. Uh, this is a, was a skyscraper in Chicago, at one point, uh, the tallest building in the world, at uh, 20 stories. And uh, you can see that along uh, a couple of lines, this line and this line, uh, the engineer, uh, E.C. Shankland, devised these cross braced frames that uh, others described as like a railroad bridge kind of turned on its uh, end. So these were called wind trusses, and you can imagine all of those diagonals working like a truss to take a lateral load down into the foundation and, and allow the rest of the connections in the building to be relatively uh, loose. Here, a more modern example. Uh, this is a, a tower in Sydney, Australia by SOM where the cross bracing is expressed on the outside of the building. And notice that the, the building is long enough in one direction that it doesn't need a specialized uh, wind system, right? That that has a big enough footprint, wide enough footprint. And remember that the, 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 um, the short wall is the one in that case that the wind is, is blowing on. So that doesn't need its own dedicated system, but the building is skinny enough that uh, in the short direction, it does need a dedicated wind bracing system. And in this case, uh, SOM have gone to the trouble to express it. If you have, say, this office, that might be a bit of an issue, uh, but that's a relatively small price to pay for a fairly lightweight, easily calculable, relatively cheap way uh, to wind brace a tall, skinny building like this, or a tall building that's skinny uh, in one direction, let's say. Um, here, another example, uh, this is the Standard Hotel in uh, New York, which has taken uh, this cross bracing idea. And as you can see, it's not uh, as quite as pure a set of triangular shapes as uh, these other ones, but it works because it has basically triangulated the vertical elevation of the building. And if you think about this, right, if you look at the diagrams on the left, um, all we need to do is take those vertical structures and add you know, one bit of triangulation to it. That could be a pure triangle. It could just be uh, members that are pinned and that are, can't really move anywhere else, right? This is an effective way of triangulating uh, the building because as you can imagine, um, they're going in opposite directions. The building would actually have to lift up and move uh, for one of those to rotate. So that triangulation doesn't necessarily have to be uh, all that regular or ordered. Uh, it just has to be there, and you have to basically have a load path for those lateral forces to get down to the to the foundations. We can stiffen the frames themselves, uh, either with what's called eccentric bracing or knee bracing, and you can see in both of those cases we're basically adding a triangular panel to the joint. Instead of triangulating the whole bay, we're triangulating that uh, single connection or that, that pair of connections we're forcing them to stay at 90 degrees. So any load now, any lateral load, is going to get resisted by the columns and girders acting in concert with one another. 
Um, architects tend to like this because we're minimizing the obstructions, especially with a, with a moment frame, just stiff connections in, in themselves. Um, engineers are often a little bit leery of these. They are expensive. They require a lot of very precise uh, work in steel frames, for instance, often welding. And they make structures hyperstatic. So the, uh, the way that these forces are getting distributed are not easily calculable. Um, we have a little bit of drift, but this, these are still relatively stiff structures. The bending moment uh, gets transferred not only to the columns, but also to the girders. Um, it, is, uh, it stresses these members in different ways. So you can imagine girders begin acting a little bit like columns. Columns begin acting a little bit like girders. And that kind of uh, confusion or that complexity uh, helps us in terms of an efficient frame, but makes it more difficult to understand uh, or, or, or to calculate. One advantage of rigid frames is that when we're working with concrete, concrete connections are almost always rigid just by their nature. And so we're almost always designing uh, hyperstatic structures in concrete anyway. And of course they have this reputation for being uh, very stiff. We use these sometimes in steel. Um, wood, we cannot get the strength uh, across the grain uh, to make these particularly reliable. In small structures, you'll see knee bracing all the time, but in taller structures, uh, for instance, um, uh, mass timber, uh, we usually need a separate system that is stabilizing uh, tall wood frames. So here, historic example, uh, this is a, a, a another 1890s skyscraper, and you can see that basically the engineers here have built it like a giant ship. They've used portal frames that, that basically take uh, this type of connection from naval architecture or from ship architecture, and these giant plates of steel here, these bulkheads, are fixing the girders and the columns to one another in such a way that you can imagine wind blowing left to right uh, is going to have a very, very hard time swaying that building. The girders and the columns are both going to have to bend uh, if, the, if the wind is going to move the, move the building. Um, this interferes a bit in the space. Uh, these were uh, are, are, are uh, along those lines there. So the way the architects responded to that was to create elliptical ceilings uh, in those offices, which um, uh, an architectural feature, probably uh, noticed, if anything, for being kind of dramatic. So uh, a way to kind of uh, make the architecture and the structure work together. Um, another kind of equally famous skyscraper from the era, the Reliance Building, where for the first time um, engineers are starting to look at making these moment connections. So as you can see, if you look closely, there's no diagonal uh, anywhere in the Reliance's structure. What they've done instead is they've made uh, slightly deeper girders, slightly wider columns, and these connections are riveted with 25 or 30 hot rivets that make a, a really tight, uh, stiff connection. And so any uh, wind that blows into the side of the building is going to get resisted by the columns, by the girders, and by every single stiff joint throughout the entire frame. Right? The whole building structure uh, is going to work to resist that wind. A uh, slightly more recent example from the 50s, Mies uh, Vandero, 86880 Lakeshore Drive. And you can see in the construction shot that there are no shear walls. There is no cross bracing. All of these joints are very tightly welded together. And again, the girders, the columns, all just a little bit bigger to take those kind of unpredictable loads. Girders taking uh, compression, columns taking bending. And when a wind hits one part of the building, literally that resistance gets spread throughout the entire frame. So every one of those joints is, as engineers say, getting recruited uh, into resisting the deflection and therefore resisting the, the, the lateral force. And this is the principle that Sears Tower or, or Willis Tower works on. Um, there are no shear walls in the Sears Tower. There is no cross bracing. Um, every one of the several uh, hundred joints uh, in the Sears Tower is actually a very, very rigid moment connection. Um, here in this construction shot, you can see this is what we call a torque box. So these are girders welded to columns, and then uh, welders have come in and welded these plates so that there is continuity between the flanges of the um, girders and the flanges of the columns. And you can imagine, again, any wind is going to uh, 
push against the building, but for the building to sway, because those torque boxes are so stiff, those very deep girders, those very thick columns are all going to have to bend a little bit. Uh, and that gives the building uh, a great deal of, uh, of rigidity. And here, just in case that's a little hard to visualize, um, you can see this is a drawing of a, a rigid or moment frame uh, under lateral loading. And if you look, you can see that all of the joints here are maintaining their 90 degree square geometry. What's changing is the shape of the girders and the shape of the columns. And so imagine all the energy of the wind is now getting absorbed by the resistance of those elements, the girders and columns, to deflection or deformation. Um, a, a wind force on a rigid frame is literally trying to bend every structural element uh, in the building. And this is why moment frames or, or rigid frames uh, are so stiff, right? so good uh, at resisting lateral loads, is they're recruiting uh, every element in the structure to help resist, uh, resist the wind. And we can, so we can think about um, these in a couple different ways. We'll talk about uh, these principles some when we talk about long spans, but um, essentially we've got a, a, a two very opposite strategies. If we're looking at braced frames, what we're typically doing uh, is we are thinking about making pinned connections, uh, but, may, but finding ways to fix those points in space. And so here, a kind of long span example, you can see that um, here we've got kind of stiff columns, but a very, very lightweight uh, beam or girder uh, attached by pins. In a moment frame, we're actually doing the exact opposite. And you can see that both the shape and the moment diagram are completely inverted from the kind of pinned beam diagram. That we actually have the, the thickest, uh, most stressed elements at the junction between, on the left, uh, column and girder on the right at the, the kind of elbow of a, of a frame shape. We'll talk more about these later, but these are essentially two opposite but equally effective ways uh, of, of, of handling these lateral forces. We either make a very lightweight pinned frame where we fix points in space, or we make a very, very heavy frame that relies on each of those individual joints working very hard uh, to resist the, the, the lateral loading that we've got. And then finally, we add to these shear walls. Um, if we're clever about it as architects, we can make these kind of disappear. We put them in cores, we wrap them around elevators or fire stairs, uh, and kind of no one's the wiser, right? It's kind of hard to find the lateral uh, resistance in a well-designed uh, central, centrally planned core. Our engineer, though, is going to tell us that there are a couple of things that, that, that this needs. They, it needs to be solid, first of all, obviously, um, but it also needs to be symmetrical, and I'll explain that here in a little bit. Um, the engineers are going to want to see very, very stiff elements like shear walls distributed evenly, regularly, symmetrically throughout the, throughout the plan. Um, engineers uh, love these. They are super rigid, very, very predictable. They take care of the gravity loads and the lateral loads, so they're relatively cost-effective. The rest of the structure can be all loose or pinned connections. Um, when we say no openings in shear walls, the engineer will tell us that, but one of the advantages is that because they're kind of so over-designed, we can actually uh, snake some pipes or the occasional duct uh, through them. Um, very, very rigid uh, buildings, low drift. We'll talk about seismic in the next lecture bites, but shear walls are actually fairly bad in seismic design uh, because they are uh, stiff, but they're also very, very brittle. Um, low cost if we're incorporating them into cores, uh, and usually we'll, we'll almost always make these out of concrete or masonry. In smaller buildings, uh, we might use plywood uh, for shear walls. When we're designing a, a shear wall building, the building is so stiff, we have some basic principles about lateral resistance that engineers will tell us for anything, but they're particularly important uh, with shear walls. And that is that because they're so rigid and the rest of the building often is so flexible, we need to make sure that the resistance that they offer is distributed fairly evenly throughout, throughout a building. So if we have um, uh, shear walls only in one axis, we know this is a problem. We need to stabilize the building in the short axis as well. So we want them to go in both directions and we want them to be roughly proportionate to uh, the, the, the dimensions of the building, the proportions of the building. And we want them to be symmetrical. 
Um, here we have a case where we've got a, a shear wall at the end of a building frame. We're going to have a very, very loose building frame here. And we're going to be worried about this end of the building moving differentially from this end. And what our engineers are going to tell us is that they want shear walls to be basically symmetrical. Doesn't have to, we don't have to be rigid about it, but they want the same amount of resistance uh, throughout the, the building structure. So we see a lot of plans in shear wall buildings that look like this, either a central core that basically has the same amount of uh, resistance in, uh, on, on both sides and a proportional amount of resistance in the long and, and short direction to the, the building proportions themselves. Um, exterior walls are fine. We've got a little bit of uh, a soft structure in the middle, um, but so long as that doesn't get too far apart, this is good, that's symmetrical. And what's gonna make an engineer really happy is if we take that shear resistance and distribute it regularly so that basically every bay uh, of this building is going to respond to the same wind force in exactly the same way. And we won't get any differential movement. We run into problems if we get asymmetrical uh, shear walls because of what's called planned torsion. And here again, we've got uh, a difference between, in, in technical terms, the center of rigidity, uh, where the average uh, center of the building stiffness is, and where the center of mass is, or, or where the wind is effectively pushing on the building. And you can see here that uh, if we have a very, very rigid core that's asymmetrical, that might stay exactly in place, but our uh, building structure over here might deflect, and might deflect so much that again, we start to run into these serviceability problems. Um, this can certainly uh, damage a structure over time, but before that happens, it will do things like rack door frames or break windows uh, in, the, in the facade. So common problems, uh, we may be doing a central core. We may be in a situation where we anticipate asymmetrical wind loads, either because of our neighbors or uh, some, some ground effect. We may have a program that demands that core be off center, or we may have a kind of change in the structure. And you can see in any one of these cases, we might have the building respond asymmetrically right here. Uh, it may uh, torque or, or rotate more than we want. And on, in both of these cases, you can see that we have more uh, deflection or more deformation in one part of the building structure than the other. And in those cases, our engineers may tell us that, you know, in this case, we may want uh, greater resisting torque. So they may want some stiffness on the exterior of the building where it's gonna be able to kind of resist or push back better. Or they may want uh, shear walls or cross bracing that will help balance the building out, that will spread that resistance, that lateral resistance more evenly uh, across the building structure. And again, if you think about our strategies, um, all of these really, whether they're braced or framed or walls, all of them really want to be as symmetrical as, as we can. You'd like to equalize the behavior of the building to, to the same wind uh, all the way across it. But because the differential between a, a rigid shear wall and a flexible frame is so great, um, these are particularly important when we talk about uh, shear walls as a, as a lateral bracing strategy. So advantages and disadvantages, cross bracing, moment frames, uh, and shear walls. Um, basically, the, the, the trade-off is that um, we are uh, often kind of um, uh, interfering with uh, either the architecture or with the function when we're uh, putting in cross bracing. Um, with shear walls, we can often wrap these around uh, vertical elements that are already there. But there are other kind of trade-offs in terms of uh, how stiff the building is, how heavy the building gets, how symmetrically we have to plan, uh, and, uh, and, um, and, and how much we're spending basically on an add-on system, right? A, a system that uh, is added on to the, to the gravity frame itself. In the next lecture bite, we'll look at um, the other major lateral issue that we have, which is seismic resistance. And we'll talk about ways that even though they're both talking about forces that are behaving sideways on the building, right, lateral forces that need lateral resistance, we'll talk about some of the peculiarities of earthquake and seismic motion uh, that mean that we have to very often adopt a kind of opposite strategy than we're used to uh, when we're applying strategies for wind resistance.